So if you have your Bibles with me, you can turn with me to Hebrews 10, 23. Um, yeah. And if you don't have your Bibles, you can use the screen. It'll be up there. But I really encourage you guys to have your own Bibles just to make sure I'm not making up stuff. So Hebrews 10, 23. So I'm going to read from verses 23 to 25. And uh, it should be on the screen too. So verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other one, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And we're just going to uh, go through these verses today. Um, but honestly, uh, these verses mean a lot to me because when I... So I, I became a Christian in ninth grade. And you'll see how this relates. But I came into Christian in ninth grade, and I remember hearing a message about fellowship. I remember hearing some guy come up and talk about how we need to fellowship, how we need to have unity between us, brothers and sisters, how we need to love each other, we need to care for each other. And I thought, yeah, we should have fellowship. And I'm going to try my best. As a ninth grader, I was like, I'm going to try my best to have fellowship and make it important. I'm going to go, you know, encourage and be encouraged by each other. I'm going to go love, feel loved and love people. And then I thought to myself and I looked around and I realized I didn't really have that many friends. In fact, I didn't even have any close friends. Um, see, because when I was a ninth grader, um, my best friend had moved away from in eighth grade and he was my best friend for 10 years and he was so close to me to where I didn't feel like I needed to make friends. And so when he moved away and he went so far, I never really saw him maybe once after, but he moved away and I just didn't see him anymore. And so I went from having someone I was so close to, to having essentially no really close friends. And hearing that message and just be, being recently saved I really wanted to have fellowship, but I looked around and I thought, I'm not even close to people. I'm not even, I don't even have friends who I can really share who I am or share my concerns or share the things that are genuine about me. Like the people around me, the people who I call friends, they're not that close because I can't even be real with them. I have to pretend to be someone I'm not. And I think that was really hard because I wanted fellowship, but I didn't really have friends. And so what I did was I prayed. I went to God and I prayed that God would give me close Christian friends. I went to God and I prayed that God would really provide people in my life who would help me to grow. And um, yeah, I remember praying for months. I started at the end of my freshman year. I started praying for friends. God, give me some Christian friends. Give me some Christian brothers that I can you know, walk this faith with, that I can have. You know, I was lonely. I didn't really have too many people to talk to, people that cared for me. But also, I just wanted to grow. I wanted to walk the Christian faith with some friends. And so I prayed for that. And three months later, guess what happened? Well, in my perspective, nothing happened. You know, it's kind of it's kind of sad. But that was just my perspective back then. And I got really discouraged. And I said, God, I've been praying for three months for friends. How come you haven't provided any friends for me? How come you haven't given any friends? And keep in mind, you know, I, when you don't really have that many friends, it's really hard for you because you don't have people to go to. And so I was really discouraged and really sad. But I kept on praying. I kept on praying more. God, give me close Christian friends. God, give me... And I would read his Bible and I'd see that when we pray... Matthew 7, he answers. That if you ask, he gives. And I read the parables, and it's just, you pray and you pray, and God will give. And so I decided I would just trust that, and I could keep praying. And so I prayed for another three months. Um, and it just didn't seem like things were happening. But um, I guess a month or two later, so I guess six or seven months after I started praying for friends, one of the, just really oddly, one of the guys on the wrestling team, so I was on wrestling, and one of the guys on the wrestling team just came up to me, and he was like, 
hey, I know you, you're Grant's brother. And I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, I am, yeah. And then he's like, yeah, we should hang out and do stuff. And I'm like, okay, cool. But I didn't think he was actually going through with this because this guy, he was, he was like the, the guys who, um, well, just loved the party. He was the guys who um, I knew, I knew, I, I don't know how I knew, but I knew that he would smoke. I knew that he would drink. I knew that he would do stuff that wasn't really stuff that I wanted to do. And so I was praying for Christian friends, and six months later, some, some guy who I thought was like this party kid comes, and he's like, yeah, we should hang out. But he didn't end up hanging out with me, um, you know. And we're getting somewhere. Don't worry. We'll get somewhere. He didn't end up hanging out with me for a whittle. For, so like two months later, I see him on the wrestling team, but it was weird. I saw him at one of the prayer meetings that I went to. See, our, cl- our Christian club had a prayer meeting, and he was there. And I was really surprised because I had always seen this guy as, you know, one of the wrestlers who hangs out with all the cool kids who does the, who parties and all that. And he was not a good student. And I saw him there and we talked and I was like, Hey, you know, I didn't know that you go to Christian club. He's like, yeah, I became a Christian a few months ago. And I think that's why he wanted to hang out with me two months ago or the two months before, because he knew I was a Christian. And he said, yeah, I became a Christian, and I'm trying to live for Jesus. And, and I talked to him, and I realized, like, he and his other wrestling friends, it looked like they genuinely believed that, and they genuinely became Christian, that they genuinely changed their life. See, they didn't care too much about the, the drinking or the drugs or any of the other stuff. It looked like they genuinely were giving their life to Jesus. And so I started, uh, I was in swim and I started ditching my six period to go to the, uh, don't do this, but to go to the lunch tables and I would see him and we'd talk about the Bible. I'm not saying that so you guys have permission to do that. Please don't, don't ditch your classes. But, and we'd talk about the Bible and we'd talk about Jesus because he was new to the Bible. He wanted to, he would ask me like questions. He'd say, you know, what does this mean in the Bible? Or what do you think about this type of theology? Or what, what do you think about this truth? And I didn't know I always had an answer, but I think growing up in church, I knew a little more than him. And so we would go and we'd just spend all of, all of six period just talking about Jesus. And he'd introduce me to his other friends, who the other guys who got saved also. And we just talked. We talked about God and we talked about what we want to live for. And it was cool. It was really cool. It was encouraging. We were able to talk about Jesus. We were able to talk about how awesome God was. And, um, and I was able to meet his other friends. I was able to talk to other Christians. But I, didn't, I still didn't feel very close to them. I still felt like, yeah, this is a cool Christian brother, but I'm not really close to him. Because at the end of the day, I knew that we didn't really relate. You know, he was always hanging out with the really cool guys who, and they were in a sense, delinquents. They would ditch school. They would always be late. They would talk back to the teachers. And I grew up and I was like, you see a teacher, you do what they say, you shut your mouth, you don't do anything, you know? And so I was this good church kid. I had pretty good grades. They didn't, you know, I was super quiet. They were super loud. Um, So I just didn't feel like, you know, we would be close friends. But then over the summer after my sophomore year, they invited me to hang out with them. And we'd, you know, go do random things, but we'd always talk about how important God was. We'd talk about the Bible. We'd talk about um, how we need to live for God more. We'd talk about how awesome Jesus is and how he's been doing stuff. And there was one time where someone started talking about how he tried to share the gospel. And you, everyone was encouraged. And that's what we talk about. We didn't have the same interests. We didn't have the same uh, hobbies. We didn't have the same background but we would talk about Jesus. And for me, that was really cool because these guys, like I wasn't the cool kid. They were the cooler guys, but they just wanted to know about Jesus. So they'd invite me and we'd talk about it. We'd talk about how awesome God was. And by doing that, I think over the summer of my sophomore year, I realized something. They became close friends and they became close brothers. And so in some sense, after praying for a year to have close friends, God answered that prayer. He did. And I'm not saying in some sense like he did answer that prayer. 
you know, I realized that God was changing these guys and God was changing me. Um, and I realized that when I was praying, you guys know I was praying for a year, basically. When I was praying at the beginning, the first three months, when nothing happened, apparently, that was the time when God was saving them. That those first three months when I went to God and said, God, how come you're not giving me close friends? That was the actual time when God had saved them. So God was answering my prayer just in a way I never would have assumed. Guys I never thought I would become friends with. You know, he did it. It took a whole year of prayer. And uh, this message isn't about prayer. It's about fellowship. And so we'll get there. But... I just wanted to encourage you guys in prayer, but also just the idea of having a friendship based upon Jesus Christ. Having a friendship based upon Christianity. Not your interests, not the things that you find cool, but a friendship that's based upon, you know, praying for each other and loving each other. And that's hard to find. That's really hard to find. And that's why I'm so thankful to God that he gave me those people. See, and that could be the ending of that story. Like, it's a happy ending. You know, God saved those guys. We became close friends. But I'm not going to end the story there. See, what happened after they started inviting me over the summer is we went to junior year together. They were seniors, but we went to junior year together. And suddenly everything just happened to be, like, happened to fit in place. I happened to have one of the classes with one of the guys. Um, you know, we went to a prayer meeting. We went to Christian club together. We went to Bible study together. Uh, they invited me to the cool kid table. And so I would sit with all these guys who I was like, man, these guys are druggies, but it's cool. Don't worry. You know, because <laughs> they still hanged around their old friends, not, not doing the things they did, but trying to change them. And so I would sit with them. And it was every day was us just coming together and talking about Jesus and talking about God, and talking about how awesome God was. And, you know, we'd pray for each other. We'd encourage each other. And then, um, randomly, just randomly, one one day, one of my friends, uh, one of, yeah, one of my friends, he came up to me, the one in the class with me. His name was Ross. He was in my German class. And he came up to me and he said, dude, I've been listening to this guy named John Piper, And he says you should preach the gospel to yourself and to others every day. And so what we did was we would just go up to each other and we'd say, you know, preach the gospel to me. And it sounds kind of weird because we're already Christian, right? Why do we need the gospel if we're already Christian? But what we would do is we'd preach the gospel in their situation. And so he would be struggling with anxiety or be struggling with depression or something like that. And I would just tell him about how because of God's love, because of the cross, and because of what Jesus did for us. Like all of that pain, we can give to God. And that it it doesn't compare. The pain doesn't compare to what Christ did for us, his love. And so we try to preach the gospel to each other daily, over and over, just showing each other what what it meant, you know, to be Christian. And um, by doing that, we were just reminded all the time of Jesus. We were reminded of our faith. We were reminded of our hope in Jesus. And, you know, I, I went off this verse for a long time, but I just want you to think about it. By preaching the gospel, we were holding fast to the confession of our hope. And, like, every time we would waver, he'd preach the gospel to us. He'd tell, like, my friend Ross, he would tell me that God is faithful, that God is sovereign, he's in control. He's in control of your situations. I don't care that you fail the test. Like, God's love is so much greater, and he's using that to shape you to become holy, to shape you to become like God, shape you to become like Jesus Christ. And verse 24, that's exactly what I felt like it was being. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Every time that I would be encouraged with the gospel, he would be stirring up love and good works with me. Not neglecting to meet together. We were meeting together every day, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I mean, I could have studied this text. I mean, I, I did study this text. I could have like gave you a ton of context, a, kind of, a ton of ex- ex- explanation, um, the historical meaning behind this text. But I just thought maybe it would be a lot more effective to just show you what it could kind of look like. To show you what possible, what that might look like in our daily lives. 
You know, it means talking about Jesus. It means having a friendship built on Christ, meeting together, stirring each other up for love and good works. And that is how we hold fast to our confession. That's how we hold fast to the promises of God. And I'm going to continue with the story. So we, uh, this is a long story, I guess. But uh, after, so the middle of my junior year, um, we started this Christian organization. And it was called Impact. And we were, we got all the high schools, Walnut High, Roland High, Wilson, Diamond Bar. We even had Chino and Sunny, well, they kind of, you know, partially. But uh, just all the high schools nearby. And we started this organization and we tried to pray together, all the Christian leaders, pray together, share the gospel to each other, and just go out and encourage each other. And uh, we hosted praise nights. We hosted uh, community events. We do banquets. Um, we passed out gospel bracelets. We tried to evangelize. We we just do a lot of things. And, uh, you know, when we passed out gospel bracelets, we would share the gospel. And you you know those things that they give to kids, those beads, with the bracelets? Have you seen them? Like, we passed them out. And I remember in high school, we made 2,000 of them or 5,000 of them, but 2,000 for my school. And we passed out so many that you would walk around and you'd see, like, maybe an eighth of the student population, just all with bracelets. And you ask them, hey, what is that? Like, you know what it is, but you just ask, hey, what is that? And they're like, I don't know. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess someone didn't share the gospel very well, but I, they think it's cool. And so people were able to hear the gospel. People were able to hear, we were just trying to evangelize. We were just trying to go out and share the gospel with people. And people would ask, like, what is that bracelet? We'd wear it too. And we'd just explain, you know, this is our sin. This is God created the world and we sinned. And this is Jesus who died for our sins. And we'd be able to talk to people about the gospel. And it'd be scary, but since we did it together, um, there was a lot of fruit. We would encourage each other, you know, don't be afraid to share the gospel. And we'd share the gospel. And our Christian club, it grew from like 70 to 120 in just a few months. And, um, and that just reminded me of that verse, you know, uh, the beginning of the month. We, when the, the church met together, people were being added to the church day by day. It's not the exact same, but people were being added to our Christian club day by day. And it was crazy. God was working. And I just, I, want, I don't mean to tell you guys this story because of like how awesome me or those guys were. Because we weren't. We were messed up people. You know, it's, it's just to encourage you guys that there's a lot of cool things that can happen if you guys are just willing to pray for each other. If you guys are willing to talk about Jesus. If you guys are willing to be excited about how awesome Jesus is. If you're excited and you find someone else who's excited, like be friends. That's, that's a good idea. So you guys can talk about Jesus. So you guys can encourage each other. And um, I think one of the biggest blessings from that organization wasn't all the stuff that we did or the organizations that we did. It was going to the weekly prayer meetings. And these weren't normal prayer meetings where you just pray for events and everyone's just like, oh yeah, we're here and we just pray for an hour. I mean, that's good too. But it was really, we wanted to encourage everyone. And we would pray for people who are hurting. And maybe you were lukewarm, or not lukewarm, but maybe you weren't caring too much about the faith. Or maybe you were struggling with um, giving God everything or you had some stuff. And every week we would just focus on God's truth. We would hear a message on how we need to cling to God for our joy. We'd hear a message on, uh, we'd, we'd sing songs and just worship and just rest in, in God's promises through his words. And we'd, we'd pray for each other. And then we'd pray for our other stuff. So it was mainly for encouraging us. And that's something I'd love to do in the future. But that itself was the most encouraging thing. And I realized that all this time, you know, talking about Jesus... I got really close to those guys and you know, some of it was bad because they taught me, they taught me how to ditch class. They taught me how to be late for class. They taught me how to talk back to the teachers. They taught me, they were the reason I didn't do any AP classes in senior year. You know, uh, they were the reason I probably ditched so much school. They, they taught me that if you want to get people out of class, you go to the bathroom and then you you tell the teacher you need to interview that guy and then you both go to the lunch tables and just hang out. That's what they taught me. Don't do it. <laughs> but all I'm saying is at the same time, what was way more important, I kind of regret saying that, what was more important was just how we need to hold fast to our hope in Jesus. Because 
you know, we weren't the best kids. That was just the reality. We weren't the best kids in terms of school. But we learned how to hold fast to Jesus. We learned how to tell people about God. And we learned how to encourage each other. And, and that was what I remember from high school. High school was so exciting because every day, daily, I was hearing the gospel from people. Daily, I was being encouraged in my faith. Daily, I was meeting and going to weekly prayer meetings or other prayer meetings or Bible study or Christian club. Daily, I was able to talk to these guys. And it wasn't only the club stuff that we, we prayed. It was just normal life. I'd go talk to them. Hey, how's your faith? We'd go rap about God's love or something. You know, you're just hanging out and doing things that just talk about how awesome God is. And it just became about that. And I just, I really encourage you guys to have that mindset of, of hoping and wanting friends who are super spiritual so that you guys can talk, you guys can love Jesus together. Um, I know last week we, um, we went through Ephesians 4, and I kind of wanted to go back to it because this was the last two verses. If you were here last week, you know. But I just saw this as, as so important because the reason for fellowship it's not just so we can hang out and have fun. It's not just so we can get lunch and be friends and there's no drama between us. The reason for fellowship is truly to grow in our faith. It's truly to know about the gospel. It's truly to correct people when they need correction. It's to encourage people, to exhort people, to love your brothers and sisters. That's the reason for fellowship. And I really encourage you guys to have that. And it says in verse 15, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him, who is the head in the Christ. And so it says that we ought to speak the truth in love to grow up to be like Christ, essentially. The head, Christ. We are to speak the truth in love to become like Christ. That's what the first verse is essentially saying. And I think that's so important because it's so easy for all of you. Just think about it. It's so easy for you to forget about the truth. Forget about our hope in Jesus. It's so easy for you to forget that our life purpose is about glorifying God. Our life goal is to become like Jesus. It's so easy to forget that God is actually the only one who's going to satisfy us. And I talked about that last week. Like God is genuinely the only one who will satisfy us. All your other desires, school, relationships, money, career, family, any of those things, they're not going to truly satisfy you. It's God. And if you're telling that truth to people, they'll be reminded of that. We, you know, you remember, we forget that God is sovereign a lot. We, f we get so anxious over the daily stuff, and we forget that. We forget that God loves us. You know, sometimes we feel like he doesn't even love us, or he doesn't forgive us, and we forget that. And that's why we need to tell the truth for, to each other, so that, you know, when you forget that truth, you tell it to each other. And we need to remind each other that, that this truth is worth living for. It's worth giving up everything for. But I think even more than just telling the truth sometimes, sometimes, and I'm going to be honest, sometimes it's not that I don't know the truth. Sometimes it's, I know the truth. I know that God loves me. I know that God's sovereign. I know that my purpose is to glorify God, but sometimes I just don't care. Sometimes it's, it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, I don't, I don't feel anything. I hear, you know, someone comes to me and they say, God is sovereign. God loves you. God gave his life for you. God is working things in your life. And it's just, I don't care. That's sometimes I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. It doesn't mean anything to me. I want it to mean something, but I just don't feel anything. Like you're telling me that God is more important in my life than I should be living for God. I agree completely. But I just, I'm, I'm going to do my school thing. Or I'm going to do my, you know, play my games. Or I'm going to do whatever things I want to do. And I think sometimes it's so easy to know the truth, but just not to do anything about it. It doesn't change you or change your life. And that's why we not only need to speak the truth, but we need to speak the truth in love. Because... There's so many times when I or others, we know the truth and we hear the truth again and again, but it, it doesn't really change us. It doesn't cause our hearts to rejoice. 
But if someone is speaking the truth in love, then, you know, imagine like, it's like, I don't feel it. But if someone's pleading with you with all their might, you guys have to live for Jesus. You guys have to see how awesome he is. If you don't see how awesome he is, then no, read your Bible, pray. You'll see that he's amazing. You'll see that he truly is your life desire. If you get, if you have someone who just loves you so much and they're speaking the truth, then when they see that you're not convinced by it, they'll just keep going and they'll plead with you and they'll say, please do this. And if that's the case, you're not going to, I hope not. If they're constantly pleading with you the truth of God, it's so much easier to then feel the love of God because you see your brother. You see your brother and his love for you. You see your sister and her love for you. And so we ought to tell the truth in love so that in the times that we feel discouraged, in the times that we feel discouraged, we see God's love. Through our brother and sister, we see God's love. And that's what fellowship genuinely is. It's telling the truth in love so that we can be joined together, held together by every joint by which it is equipped when it is working properly to build each other up in love or the body up in love. And so fellowship isn't only... I think oftentimes we, we think fellowship is just... you. I, we, we talk about fellowship and it's like, go talk to the people who don't really have that many friends or go reach out to the people who don't feel as included or go uh, help people and go you know, get a meal with them and share about Jesus. And, and essentially it's all about, you know, you going out and you being someone so that people can feel included and people can feel unified. That's part of it. But you realize fellowship is oftentimes for you. It's for your growth. Fellowship is for you guys. If you want fellowship, if you go for fellowship, if you strive to have fellowship, you will benefit spiritually. You will be the one growing. You will be the one. You might be encouraging a lot of people, but you'll get some encouragement back too. And you'll be growing. And so fellowship is ultimately for the purpose of knowing Jesus more. It's for, it's for our, our standing and our unwavering hope. It's for trusting in God. It's, fellowship is for us. It's for, it's, if you have fellowship, it will not only benefit the people that you talk to, the people that you encourage. It's going to benefit you. You know, because you need encouragement, you need reproof, you need exhortation, you need someone to watch over you, you need someone to encourage you when you just don't feel it, when you just don't care, when school is more important than your spiritual life, when relationship is more important than your spiritual life, when friendship or being included or feeling comfortable, when those things are more important than your spiritual life. You know, sometimes you know the truth. Sometimes you need to hear the truth that God loves you, and sometimes you need someone to truly tell the truth with love, to truly care for you. And I think when you have that, then there's true fellowship. And um, I know we're running out of time, and so I'll skip to the application questions. Actually, let's go to the big idea. Genuine fellowship. And uh, I forgot about this, but yeah, you need to have genuine fellowship, guys. And you saw it in the Bible. You saw the need for genuine fellowship. It's, it's so that you can hold fast to your hope in Christ, in Jesus Christ. It's so you can hold fast to the unwavering promise. It's so you guys don't forget. And um, application-wise, I don't have it up there, but I just want to ask you guys, like, how many of you actually pray for people in person? And not, I'm not talking about when you're at prayer meeting and they say, pray for this guy. I'm saying on your own, when no one tells you to do it. How many of you ever go around to each other and say, hey, let me encourage you. Let me pray for you. How many of you have ever gone around and, and go and talk to people and just try to love them? It's hard because sometimes you feel awkward or you're like, I don't know this guy that well. I don't know this girl very well. But some, people are hurting around you. People need to feel loved. People need to hear the truth in love. And so we need to encourage each other. And so I'm just... I want to challenge you guys with that. How often do you actually pray for people? How often do you actually encourage each other? How often are your conversations about Jesus and the Bible? Or are they often about, are they often about you know, you or some games you like or some people or school or relationships or any of those? I think it's so easy for things to be about the world, but we need to make our conversations also about Jesus 
about encouraging each other. And another question is, how much are you guys willing to sacrifice? How much are you guys willing to sacrifice for fellowship? Like, is this something that's not a big deal to you, you know? Or are you willing to be embarrassed and lose comfort and lose maybe even status or relationship or, or, or even your ability to do super well at school, you know? Sometimes we have to give up these things for the sake of fellowship, for the sake of our personal growth and the growth around us, the unity. And, um, yeah, I just want to challenge you guys with that. Um, if you, maybe you're like me in ninth grade and you don't really have that many close friends, pray for it. Pray for friends. Go around and talk to people. Pray for friends, though. God will answer your prayers. That's, that's the truth. That's not what the message is about today, but genuinely, that's, you know, we need to have fellowship. And so I want to encourage you guys with that. I really hope that you guys are able to really see the need for fellowship, really see the need to go out and to share the, go- share the gospel, not only with the unbelievers, but with the people around you. Like that might be some- weird to some of you, but you guys need to hear from each other encouragement. You guys need to hear love from each other because if you're not encouraging each other, then, then you're just going to get scared when you try and share the gospel and maybe... No one's, and, and then as soon as you get discouraged, no one's going to encourage you and you might stop. But if you're constantly encouraging each other, you are going to live faithfully for God. And that's the need for fellowship. You know, it's for, it's for our hope in Jesus. And um, yeah, let me pray for you guys. Um, but I just, I truly hope that you guys take fellowship seriously. Let's pray. Dear God, I uh, I thank you for your kindness towards us, Lord. I thank you that you are so good to us. I pray for all of us that we will see the need for loving our brothers and sisters. We'll see the need to go out and to make our lives about you. And that includes our relationships with our family and with our friends and brothers and sisters, Lord. We need to make our conversations, we need to make our lives about you. I pray that you would encourage us here to really be on fire for our faith. And to take that and to connect with other people who are on fire with our faith. And that we would just be united together as a fellowship, building each other up to do love and good deeds. To hold fast to our unwavering promise in Jesus Christ. Not neglecting to meet together, but to live ultimately for you, God. God, you are coming soon. The day is coming near when you will return. And I pray that we will be united, working together for the gospel. I pray that Jesus will be so important to us that we will live faithfully for you, Lord. And so be with us. Help us to have a good time of discussion and help us just to be challenged with your word, challenged to know that you you call us to, to fellowship. Help us to know that prayer works and that you love us. Help us to hold fast to your promises in your narrow prayer. Amen.